On this super review, let's take a look at the Google Pixel 4 XL. So at this point, you've probably already heard a lot about the Google Pixel 4. Some of it probably pretty good, some of it maybe not so good. And what I'm really interested to find out is how much of that stuff actually matters in my day-to-day -day life. So I don't know, let's start with the obvious things about the Pixel 4. Like other Pixels, Google has positioned this as a camera first smartphone. They put a lot of time into the camera software as well as they've actually changed up the camera hardware this year. I'm interested to see how that plays out, right? So with the Pixel 4, in addition to the standard wide angle camera lens, you also get a telephoto camera lens. And I'm, I'm curious to see how I like that versus, you know, on my Samsung S10e, that comes with a ultra wide lens. And I think I prefer that, but I don't know. We'll find out how much I care. Other things that I think I'm gonna care about is the Pixel 4 has got a 90 Hertz refreshing screen. And what that basically means is that I expect that things like scrolling are gonna be really nice and smooth on this thing. I also kind of think it's gonna take a hit to the battery life, but again, we're gonna find out. Uh, but some of the things that I know are not the greatest about this thing are, well, that battery life. So I know that the Pixel 4 XL has got a smaller battery than what you got in last year's phone. And in addition to that 90 Hertz refresh rate, maybe that means that the battery life is actually gonna be worse. But is it worse to the point that it matters? That's what we're gonna find out. So let's go ahead and open up the box of the Google Pixel 4 XL, and then I'll spend some time living with this phone, and I'll come back and I'll let you know all the different things that you've heard about this phone. Do they actually matter? All right, so I've been living with the Pixel 4 as my daily driver for the past few weeks. It's replaced my iPhone XR, and I've really just been trying to spend some time with it and figure out what are the things that matter. There's some new features here. Do they matter? There's some controversies here. Do they matter? And importantly, there was a pretty significant update to the phone that was made in early November, and I'm glad I had a chance to experience that update because it's changed things a little bit, I think for the better, but We'll get into that. Um, we can just start by talking about the phone, by talking about the build and the physical aspects of this phone, which 
okay, it's kind of a big phone and it's kind of hard for me to hold that against it because this is the XL model, but it's still a fairly big phone. I, you know, the screen size is 6.3 inches, which is I think exactly the same as the iPhone XR or the iPhone 11. But because of these bezels, right, you've got that, you've got that little forehead and you got this little bit of a chin on the bottom. Because of that, it is actually a taller phone than the XR. I don't know that I actually care that much because, well, the phone's actually thinner and quite a bit lighter than the iPhone XR and the iPhone 11. And I think that those actually matter to me a little bit more than the overall height, like the height that's coming from this, this little forehead it doesn't bother me too much. I think aesthetically, maybe it's not the best, but the height, I don't mind too much. So the bezels, they don't really bother me, but what does kind of bother me are these rounded corners on the screen. Now, okay, yeah, a lot of screens have rounded corners on them. And in fact, the iPhone XR that, I've, that I'm, I'm fine with has got rounded corners that have got basically the same wide radius, but I like it much less here on the Pixel. And the reason why is just that not every Android phone has corners with this wide of a radius. And because of that, app developers don't really know how to design their apps to fit every screen. And the result is that some apps just occasionally you'll, you'll create some really funky shapes because of how large the radius is on this rounded screen, if that makes any sense. I mean, I'll show you some examples so you can see what I'm saying, and it's probably not gonna bother you. You're probably a normal person and you'll look at that and be like, oh, who's gonna notice that? Well, I'm the guy that notices that and I'm the kind of guy that doesn't really like that. So I wish these, I wish these corners really just didn't have such a large, large radius. What I do like though, is the overall aesthetic of the phone. I mean, okay, the front of it's not the hottest looking, we'll get over that. But around here in the back, I think it's actually a pretty good look. You got this nice clean white matte finish it's actually pretty good at resisting fingerprints too, which this might be the first phone that I've had in a really long time that's pretty good at resisting fingerprints. So kudos to Google for that. Uh, the large camera cutout square here, I don't think it's bad looking. In fact, I think this looks better than the square cutout on the newer iPhones, just cause those look a lot busier. Here they've kind of blacked it out and it just looks simple. I like the black edges around the, the the edge of the phone as well. That's a nice touch that you don't see very often. And I don't know that, I don't think they're plastic. I think it is like a, a painted metal, which maybe could be an issue in the long run. Like maybe that paint will wear off, but maybe I'm also just worrying about something that's never gonna happen. In fact, I'm not worrying about it right now. It's just something to maybe think about, but yeah, overall aesthetically, I do like this phone. And again, I do like how thin and light it is. What I don't like quite so much, and these will be my last two complaints about the physical aspects of this phone, uh, there's no headphone jack. And okay, that's true with most phones, including my iPhone XR, but the Pixel 3a, which came out earlier this year, has a headphone jack. Well, here we've got a much more expensive Pixel phone and it doesn't have a headphone jack. And as a nerd who uses wired headphones, I find that annoying. Uh, the other omission here that's kind of a bummer for people like me that want to use a phone as a digital audio player is there's no room for a micro SD card. You can't expand your memory. And I think that the most memory you can get this phone with is 128 gigs, which is what I've got here. And it's enough for my library, but just barely. And if I start loading this thing up with a bunch of a bunch of like movies and photographs and stuff like that, it's gonna start crowding out my music library and I'm gonna start having issues carrying my library with me because there's no micro SD card and I find that kind of a bummer. Now you might be thinking, you want a headphone jack, you want a micro SD card, why don't you just stick with Samsung or even LG? And the reason is that what I really like about Google is I like the stock Android experience. I, I just, I want no bloatware, I want guaranteed you know, frequent security updates. I wanna make sure that there's no software that's kind of loaded on the phone that I can't touch that's interfering with the performance. I just like stock Android. And there's also a lot of consistencies that you get by having stock experience. Whereas with something like One UI, even though it's fairly stockish, there's enough sort of inconsistencies layered in there that just irritate a person like me. Again, if you're a normal person out there, you probably don't care. 
but a person like me, I get annoyed by that kind of stuff. And here with the stock experience, I don't gotta worry about that. Android 10 has done a couple of things that I think are pretty nice, including um, some of the gesture systems, which I'm accidentally triggering here as I flick my finger around. But I like the new gesture stuff that they've introduced with Android 10. It's actually honestly quite a bit like the, the latest iOS gesture system, which I'm happy they copied, but I'm actually not gonna give Apple credit for this because that gesture system to me harkens back to the gesture system on the old Palm WebOS, which I loved. And so I think Apple ripped off Palm and then Google ripped off, well, maybe they ripped off Apple or maybe they ripped off Palm, but either way, I'm happy about it. The one thing I'm not quite so happy about is that Google seems to have adopted a really annoying quirk that Apple does that all right, this is gonna get complicated, but bear with me. So if you are swiping along the bottom edge of the screen, you can go between your apps and they go roughly in the order that you last used them. However, once you stop and start using an app, that becomes sort of the rightmost app rather than remaining. Let's say if I swiped over three cards and now I feel like in space, in mental space, I'm three cards over, I would like to stay there. Google, like Apple, once you start using that app, it transitions that third card over to the far end. And I don't know if this is gonna, if this is gonna read, if you're gonna understand at all what I'm talking about, but if you've used this phone or an, a modern iPhone and you've had trouble keeping mental track of where apps are in this sort of, you know, uh, made up space, that's what I think is causing that issue. And it's just a design decision I'm not a big fan of. And unfortunately, Google has adopted it here. Not a big deal, frankly, but I was gonna use this opportunity just to call it out. The other aspect of the new gesture system that I'm not really a big fan of is the new back button implementation. So if I swipe here from the edge of the screen, I get the Android back button. And that seems like actually a fairly smart solution except for the fact that a bunch of apps, including a ton of Google apps are designed so that swiping in from the edge of the screen brings in a contextual menu. And I think that it's kind of an odd choice that Google has turned that into a universal back button. You can also swipe in from the right edge of the screen to get the same back function. And I feel like that would have, if they had just done that one, would have interfered less with existing apps and their edge swiping functionality. I don't know, again, this is just kind of an issue with Android in general, because there are so many different UIs out there, right? Samsung has got a different solution for back buttons. I'm sure LG has got their own back button where you just kind of wink at it. Because there's all these different solutions for gestures and stuff on Android, app developers kind of have to they have to design for the lowest common denominator. And unfortunately here, it comes into conflict with the back button on Android 10. And another way that this stock Android experience is kind of disappointing me here on the Pixel 4 is that I've found it's actually kind of surprisingly buggy. I'm not sure exactly what's going on, but um, a lot of the stuff that I'll notice is on like the lock screen or like transitions from the lock screen to the home screen where the screen is just kind of doing things and I'm not sure, like it'll flash and it'll blink in ways that I don't expect. And very often, like I'm, I'm launching uh, the Google Assistant and I don't know how I'm launching Google Assistant. Like I've gone in and I've disabled every way that I know that I could accidentally launch Google Assistant, right? I could launch it accidentally by talking to her or I could accidentally launch it by squeezing it. I turn that stuff off and I'm still accidentally triggering Google Assistant from the lock screen. I'm really, really quite confused about how that's happening, but I have to I have a feeling it has something to do with like the, the the thing appearing here and being tapped somehow. I don't I don't know what's going on. Apart from that, just kind of I've experienced a, a number of little bits of jank, like frame drops and animations and stuff. They're maybe a little bit hard to describe and I can't reproduce them reliably. But they're things that kind of cut into the appeal of a stock Android experience. Now, I do think that some of that jank has actually gotten better with the November update to the Pixel 4, but not all of it. One big difference I did get with that November update is a much more mm, comprehensible 
90 hertz screen. So I think I mentioned during the intro that one of the big features with the Pixel 4 is you've got a 90 hertz refresh rate on the screen. And what that means is that when you're scrolling things, they just animate much more smoothly. And it, frankly, it looks really nice. However, when the phone first came out, it was really weird. Like the 90 hertz would only activate in really specific situations. Like you had to have the screen brightness almost all the way up, which I almost never do because I want to maximize my battery life, which meant that most of the time I wasn't actually getting a 90 hertz screen. But with the November update, Google's made it so that the 90 hertz screen is active much more often. And frankly, I feel like I'm getting the benefit of 90 hertz at every time that I want to. I wouldn't complain about the implementation of that smooth refresh rate here anymore. Before that November update, it was, I had no idea why that feature was even, why they even bothered putting it on the phone. But now I'm pretty into it. I do think that it's nice. I do think that every phone in the future is gonna have a smooth refresh rate screen, but I don't know that it's the sort of feature that's gonna make or break a phone for me. Like, I don't think I'm gonna have any trouble going back to a 60 Hertz refresh rate phone. It's nice to have 90 Hertz, but it doesn't make or break the experience for me. On the plus side, even after that November update and while I've got 90 Hertz active almost all the time, I haven't actually noticed any any worse battery life. Like the battery life on this thing has stayed relatively steady, even with that higher refresh rate. So that much is good. And I know that the, the battery on the Pixel 4 has been, it's a little bit notorious because the battery here is actually smaller than the battery on the last phone. At least I think that's right. It's definitely not any bigger. And with that extra refresh rate, you would think that that's gonna make a, make a, make a hit to the longevity of the battery. And I'll be frank, the battery life here is not great. With the Pixel 3a that I tried earlier this year, that thing had actually really outstanding battery, but it also had a really slow processor. And this thing, it's not got a slow processor. It's got a modern processor and it's got that 90 Hertz display. And the battery life is just okay. I didn't find that it was terrible battery life. It's just okay. I'm still getting through most days. And at the end of the day, I've got around 40 to 50% battery life. So for me, that's okay. But on my iPhone 10R during with like the same kind of usage, I'm at at least 60% battery life. So, well, I don't know. It's don't get this for the battery life, but I also wouldn't shy away from it too much because of the battery life. But maybe that's also because I did a number of things just to try and maximize the battery life here. So for one, I disabled the always on display. Uh, I didn't really like it that much. I find that it makes the unlock experience a little bit confusing. And I don't know, I was just, I don't it, it didn't do much for me. So I went ahead and disabled that to try and make my battery life a little bit stronger. Another thing that I disabled to try and make my battery life a little bit stronger is all the radar nonsense, the solely radar stuff that this, this phone does. I really don't get it. I mean, the face unlock, I like that aspect of it. The face unlock on the Pixel 4, I find is pretty fast, pretty reliable. I don't think it does quite as good a job of unlocking it when I'm wearing sunglasses as my iPhone does. But apart from that, I don't really have any complaints about the face unlock. All the other stuff that has to do with this little radar on the front of the phone, I, it seem, it's super gimmicky in my opinion. They, these are the kind of gimmicks I would expect from someone like Samsung or LG and not so much from Google. So I don't know, you can like wave your hand in front of the phone to wake it up, or you can wave your hand to change songs in certain apps. It doesn't work very reliably. And I found that kind of like a, kind of like the, the, the always on display, it made the unlock experience really confusing for me. Like the phone would just kind of randomly turn itself on when I didn't think I was anywhere near activating the radar stuff, the radar, radar gobbledygook. And I don't know, I think that it didn't add anything to experience. In fact, it made the experience much more confusing and irritating. And so I turned it off and hopefully that's contributed to a little bit better battery life. And if you're worried about your battery life, I encourage you to turn that stuff off. Now this wouldn't be a pixel review if I didn't talk about the cameras. So I'll talk a little bit about the cameras, but I'll be perfectly honest with you. The cameras, I don't think are a good enough reason to get a phone. 
anymore. I feel like all phones kind of have pretty good enough cameras and they've, you know, maybe got individual tricks that make them better in certain scenarios than other cameras or other phones. But for the most part, I think that the camera on the Pixel 4, it's a good camera, but I think I could say that about a number of other phones, including my iPhone XR or even the Samsung S10e. Um, I mean, you've got things like Night Sight, which is cool. I used it once to take a picture of my pumpkins that I carved on Halloween, but that, I don't know, that's pretty edge casey. And if I couldn't have taken that picture, I wouldn't feel too bad about it. Um, you've got also the telephoto lens that they've packed into the Pixel 4. And if you plan on taking a number of telephoto photos, I think this is actually done pretty well. So it's got a 2X lens but then they've also got some software trickery in there to give you a full 8x zoom. And now most of the times when you have got a digital zoom, you're just gonna make your photo look bad. And when you are looking through the camera app and you zoom in to your full 8x, I'll be frank, it doesn't look great. But once you take the picture and the camera has gotten done processing it, the final image at 8x zoom actually looks pretty decent. I mean, it doesn't look as good as any other photo that's gonna come out of like the standard lens, but it doesn't look bad. It doesn't look like a bad 8X digital zoom. So whatever Google's doing here, it's a little bit special and it does make this phone, it gives it a bit of a specific use case for photography, but for me, it's not really something I use. In fact, I don't think I took a single telephoto photo except for things where I was testing. Like they were just test photo shots. There wasn't anything that I needed to be telephoto. The other camera trick that Pixel is known for is portrait modes and blurring out the background. And if I'm perfectly frank, I'm kind of over it. Like I thought it was really cool when I got my Pixel 2 and I got that portrait mode and I was doing it for basically every selfie I took. I was taking selfies I wouldn't normally take because I was kind of in love with the portrait mode. And it's just as well done here, if not even better, but I'm kind of over the gimmick, frankly. I don't need fake background blur in my smartphone photos. If you're into it, you'll probably like it here, but personally, I don't need it. So out of five stars, I'm gonna give the Pixel 4. Three, five, four, three. You get three stars, Pixel. You're not a bad phone, but I'm kind of having a hard time finding out what it is or figuring out what it is that you really do best. You're not a cheap phone. This is like a thousand dollar phone that I'm holding here in my hands and for that thousand dollars, you get a relatively large display with a pretty, I don't know, pretty typical build and physical aspects. I mean, it looks nice. That's cool. Uh, you get a 90 hertz display, which at this point with the November update, I do think is a pretty nice feature. But again, I don't think it's, it's not gonna convince me to upgrade. You get a camera, which again, it's a good camera, but I also don't think that it's a big difference with the cameras that you get on cheaper phones like the Samsung S10e or even the iPhone 11. Um, and then, I don't know, I, you do get that stock Android experience, but I'm kind of disappointed in the stock Android experience, if I'm perfectly frank. I still like it on my other phones. In fact, I picked up my Pixel 2 while I was re reviewing this and the Pixel 2, it's got Android 10 on it. And that felt like it was actually a little bit better and a more consistent experience than what I've got here. Now, obviously this has got a more, a more updated hardware. It's got a faster processor. There's gonna be things that this can do that the Pixel 2 probably can't do as well, but just in general, general usage, the Pixel 2 actually feels a little bit smoother and free of bugs where this still feels like it's a little bit of a beta. So I don't know. I don't think the Pixel 4 is a bad phone, but I'm having a hard time figuring out why you should buy it. All that said, if you are interested in buying this, of course, I've got links in the description down below. And while you're down there, if you like the video, you can hit the like button, you can subscribe to the channel, and then I'll see you on the next Super Review.